What's up guys, welcome back to another CSCS study session. Today we're gonna to cover chapter eight, and that is on psychology of athletic preparation and performance. Another relatively quick chapter, so if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below, and I'll be happy to answer them. So, here we go. Sports psychology, arousal, anxiety, and stress. So these are the basic terms that we need to start with um, before getting um, into detail about other relatively complicated concepts in this chapter. And so arousal is defined as intensity of motivation. And then there's also anxiety, right? So anxiety is actually a subcategory of arousal that's negatively perceived. So you have these two types of anxiety here, state anxiety and trait anxiety. State anxiety depends on the subjective experience um, itself. So whereas the trait anxiety depends on your personality. So um, two very different types of anxieties and then cognitive state anxiety and somatic um, state anxiety kind of falls under state anxiety, right? So cognitive meaning in your head, um, there's worries and negative thoughts that refers to cognitive state anxiety and then somatic um, is perceived physiological arousal or anxiety relative to the actual event that's happening. And then, like I said, of course, the trait anxiety has to do with your personality, okay? And then there's finally um, stress, and that is substantial imbalance between demand and response. Um, imbalance between reality and expectations, I guess. So moving on to influence of arousal on performance, there's different theories here. We're going to go over them. Um, so if you see here, drive theory by Hall, increase in arousal and anxiety is going to increase performance as well. So drive theory, just think of it as a linear graph where you increase anxiety and arousal. You also increase performance. Um, there's inverted U theory also. Arousal facilitates performance up to optimal level, but if you go past that point, it starts to decrease performance actually, right? So there's these graphs here, um, if you see. So here we go, this is just, this is the graph that I just drew, right? So you go up with arousal, you keep going this way, but you hit a certain point where it's not as efficient anymore, or effective, right? So that's when the performance starts to decrease. And then there's this graph here. As you can see, for an untrained or lower skilled um, athlete and have lower competitive experience, their spectrum of arousal is smaller than a, relative to a person that has more experience, right? Because they can handle more stress is one way to kind of think about it. Um, and then there's introverted and extroverted people. Um, they perceive arousal differently and that kind of shows in their performance. So introverted people, like I said, smaller um, spectrum and then extro extroverted people have a bigger spectrum they can kind of handle. I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything um, that's here, but that's just what they're saying. And then there is um, complex sports skill. So with complex sports skill, the spectrum for arousal and how much it affects performance is smaller. And then simple, you know, you can mess around more and have less pressure, right? Because it's simpler. So that graph or the spectrum tends to be bigger. And that's all it's saying. So now going back to the different types, um, individual zones of optimal functional functioning theory this just means that different people perform optimally with different arousal level which kind of makes sense right the most neutral way to look at it and then there's catastrophe theory cognitive anxiety determines the effect of physiological arousal on performance so catastrophe right cognitive anxiety and that's going to determine the effect of physiological arousal and the actual performance and then there's reversal theory where arousal and anxiety affects performance depending on how the different athletes interpret it so again another very neutral theory 
So we're going to talk about motivation and attention now. Um, there's intrinsic and extrinsic rewards and motivation. So intrinsic meaning you're doing it for yourself, for your own self and for your own good versus extrinsic, you're doing it for an external reward, whether that be a new contract for these athletes or money or trophy, whatever it is, right? And then there's attention. And attention is defined as processing environmental and internal cues that come to awareness, how much focus and attention you might have to these internal cues. And so selective attention suppresses task irrelevant cues. So meaning um, if you're just focusing on one thing, you can kind of suppress the noise or task irrelevant cues, right? And then there's routine. So you're consciously directing thoughts to task relevant concerns. That's how they define routine. And then there's different attentional styles. So this may be a little confusing the first time you look at it, but the way I look at it is I divide it into narrow and broad. So when you're thinking narrow, you're just focused on one thing, right? And when you're focused on one thing and you do something about it, that's you acting on it. So that's act. And external just means that it shows on the outside, right? And then so and then also when you're focused and you're doing not doing anything external, that shows but you're doing everything up here that's preparing. So that's what this is. And now broad means that you're not focusing just on one thing, but you're kind of um, understanding the bigger picture. And when you're doing that and you're doing something about it, externally showing you know what you're doing, you're assessing the situation versus you're doing everything up here that's analyzing the situation. So that's all it is. All right, so psychological techniques for improved performance. There's different relaxation techniques um, that they discuss to that the athletes might use to control elevated arousal and anxiety. So diaphragmatic breathing, you might have heard of this before. PNS, parasympathetic nervous system, promotes opposite effects of SNS. And SNS tend to kind of promote that fight or flight response, right? So PNS kind of calms you down. And that's what diaphragmatic breathing is. Progressive muscular relaxation, control of skeletal muscle tension, um, autogenic training is exercises to produce warmth and heaviness in body. So these concepts are kind of straightforward. So I'm just going to read them to you and you can follow along. And um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Systematic desensitization. You're using mental and physical cues. Um, and they're allowing the athletes to replace fear with relaxation. So what we want is relaxation, not fear, right? Uh, imagery, you're kind of um, coming up with a mental visual picture of an athletic event, for example. Self-efficacy and self-talk, pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. And then there's goal setting, right? So there's four different kind of goals here. This is also pretty self-explanatory here. Process goals, you're coming up with goals that are relevant throughout the whole process versus outcome goal. You're just focusing on the outcome and the results and making a goal based on that short term and long term goals. All right. So more dis er, more definitions here. And we're going to now talk about practice instructions and feedback. So with practice schedule, you can practice the, the whole thing and address the skill in full or you can practice parts of it using these different methods. So segmentation, you're breaking it into parts that have clear breaks between them. So, um, for example, if uh, you're doing gymnastics, you're kind of breaking the routines into different parts and that have clear breaks in between them. That's segmentation. Fractionalization is breaking the tasks or what you're practicing into subcomponents that occur simultaneously. So. Uh, you can't really break these apart because there's no clear breaks in between them. Um, simplification is adjusting the difficulty of task by changing the task characteristics. So making things more simple and straightforward. Um, so if you're a quarterback practicing instead of um, having all these linemen and uh, all the players around you, maybe just throwing the ball to your receiver 
is one way to simplify uh, practicing for the drill or uh, practicing and then there's pure part training uh, which is practicing each subcomponent subcomponent and then putting them all together at the end there is also progressive part training so for this one you put two parts together just two 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 and then you put them all together progressively and then there's repetitive part training where you're just practicing one part until you get that and then you practice the next part until you get that and then you just keep adding on different parts so that's practice instructions there's three different types here explicit instructions guided discovery and discovery um, with explicit instructions you're giving the most amount of cues to whoever you're giving feedback to or instruction to so prescriptive information right guided discovery you're kind of letting them um, get it themselves but you're also giving instructions on overall movement and the bigger picture and finally discovery there's little to no directions so you're kind of letting them be and figure it out themselves feedback last part um, there's intrinsic augmented knowledge of results and knowledge of performance so intrinsic is provided by the athlete himself or herself you kind of let them like I said in the previous slide figure it out on their own and then there's augmented feedback where it's everything else um, other than intrinsic so as long as I say something or some feedback that is augmented knowledge of results has to do obviously with the the results right so provide athlete information about execution of task goal and the knowledge of performance has to do with the general movement pattern and so but that is it for chapter eight sports psychology i hope you guys found it helpful if you have any questions always always let them know in the comment section down below i'll be happy to answer them if you like the video please hit the subscribe button i'd really appreciate that all right see you guys next time